Hello, health psych students. I hope everybody is being safe out there. I hope everybody is healthy and no one is infected at this point. Um, okay, so I'm about to do part two, the last part of these, the smoking and tobacco use lecture. If you have not watched part one, you would wanna watch that one first. So let me find the PowerPoint for us. We left off on talking about um, the bio, psychology and we went through opponent process and if you feel like you're still struggling to understand opponent process you will want to go and um, take a look at part one and review that because that's very important for your understanding of how cigarette smoking is so addictive how it's so difficult for people to quit okay so next slide we know that nicotine only takes seven seconds to, after a puff, to have an effect on the neurotransmitter substances in the brain. And remember that that effect we consider to be primary positive reinforcement. Primary meaning it's affecting that individual on a physiological level. Positive in that you've added something, you've added the nicotine, and the reinforcement is that obviously um, it feels good for individuals. Now we know if we do some calculations here, we know that a one pack a day smoker takes about 7,300,000 7, cigarettes a day, and that would amount to about 73,000 puffs per year. And I want us to kind of conceptualize this as every single puff on a cigarette in the way it can affect us in primary reinforcement on the brain is a learning trial. Okay. And I want us to put this into context with our own human physiology. Most of us do not get thirsty that frequently and satisfy our thirst that frequently. Most of us definitely don't get hungry that frequently and satisfy our hunger um, as much as the nicotine reinforcement. And I don't know how much sex you youngsters are having, but I doubt it 73,000 times a year. So what I'm trying to hit home here is the fact that cigarette smoking and nicotine addiction is very, very powerful because there's a lot of learning trials that are occurring and it's very powerful reinforcement. If you add to that the classical conditioning that occurs um, that triggers cigarette smoking, um, there are lots of different things for people. It could be driving in the car, it could be talking on the phone, it could be certain times a day, certain emotions that they feel, usually negative emotions, uh, being around certain people, um, taking a break at work, that type of thing. So lots of different things um, are related to that. I do want to spend some time talking about vaping because um, this is certainly a newer thing that we've been dealing with. Um, the research is rather new also. We are seeing increasing popularity in vaping. About 37% of 10th graders are already experimenting with vaping. It is more frequently linked with cigarette use six months later. So what ends up happening is a lot of individuals start vaping, they get addicted to the nicotine, and the vaping's expensive, more expensive than cigarettes. So then they end up um, transferring over and using cigarettes later. Um, there is also research suggesting um, that linking cigarette smoke smoking cigarettes in those who would not have ever started smoking cigarettes. So there are people out there that are thinking that the vaping is safe. So they begin vaping and they end up on cigarettes. And if there weren't the vaping available, if they hadn't tried that, they would never have become cigarette smokers. So vaping really is the gateway drug, the gateway drug into cigarette smoking. Um, we know that from a harm perspective, um, it seems like um, it's not reducing harm, even though a lot of people thinking that vaping is safe. Um, it's linked to death because of chemical exposures. Um, there is documented uh, passive vaping happen hazards, meaning like secondhand. If you are uh, walking by somebody and they're vaping, this has happened on campus. I, I find it interesting when I'm driving and somebody's vaping in the car with their window open in front of me and it, you know, plumes are coming out of their windshield, that type of thing. Um, and people are more likely um, to even continue vaping than those who would have done smoking cessation. So it is a new problem on the block. Um, we have an estimated somewhere between 55 and 99 death cases already in North Carolina based on the Center for Disease Control. So we've got a brand new problem on the block and it is not safer, that's a myth. Um, and it is again, gateway to cigarette smoking. So 
When we take a look at um, individuals who are trying to quit, most of those individuals who do quit, they do so on their own. And if you recall Prochaska and DiClemente who developed the stages of change, they studied cigarette smokers who had quit on their own and took a look at what kind of processes those smokers had gone through um, before they were able to successfully quit. 90% of people um, would like to quit but feel like they can't and usually the reason why they feel like they can't is they um, try to quit smoking and they start experiencing um, the withdrawal syndrome which is very gnarly um, and oftentimes will last a whole week. It feels very flu-like for individuals um, and I have a lot of difficulty being able to concentrate that type of thing. So a lot of people take that kind of those symptoms that they have in withdrawal and then make this conclusion of like, oh, I can't, I can't quit because um, look how bad this withdrawal is. Um, the 5% success per attempt, which is, uh, which is even less than the success at quitting heroin, that is information that we usually don't use when we are counseling a cigarette smoker who is motivated to quit, who wants to quit. We don't tell them, hey, you can try quitting, but your chances are only 5%, it's quite low. Um, but what we do do as healthcare providers is we take that information and we just sort of pack it in the back of our minds because it helps remind us that again quitting is not an event most people make multiple quit attempts before they actually succeed in quitting and so it helps us as a healthcare provider um, prevents us from getting frustrated when people um, make an attempt but they don't succeed because we know that most people have to make a lot of attempts um, part of the reason why it is harder to quit smoking than it is to quit heroin is if we go back to what we just talked about all of the classical conditioning that cues that opponent process is much more frequent in cigarette smoking. If people smoke at different times a day in different places around different people, that type of thing. But individuals who shoot up heroin don't tend to do that while driving their car, um, talking with other individuals. Um, they don't do it multiple times a day. And so it's easier to break those conditioned bonds. Um, for somebody who is using something really hard like heroin than it is to break those bonds um, for cigarette smoking. But we're going to talk more about how to, how to break those learned bonds. Um, most people who want to quit smoking um, do so for health reasons. Just about everybody nowadays um, knows that uh, smoking is unhealthy. Uh, a lot of people will want to quit smoking because of social pressure, particularly if members of their family um, or their friends um, are non-smokers or have quit smoking. There's pressure to quit. When I was a little girl, I think I was about eight years old. I can't remember. Um, but my dad um, quit on my birthday. He quit smoking um, when I was little on my birthday, which makes me think I was a budding health psychologist somewhere back even in childhood because I must have been griping about it or nagging him or something like that. So it was quite the birthday present that he quit um, for me on my birthday. Many individuals who want to quit smoking want to save um, money. Um, uh, cigarettes are relatively cheap in the tobacco growing states here in the south, but if you um, go up northeast or if you go out to California, that type of thing, they add a lot of sin taxes, disincentive taxes, um, and, and bring in quite a lot of tax revenue um, from cigarettes, but they're a lot ex more expensive. In those places um, and then also for lower insurance costs if you go to buy life insurance which many of you college students probably don't have um, if you go to buy life insurance they will usually either test your blood or test your saliva and you have to prove physically that you are a non-smoker in order to get a cheaper premium on life insurance if you are a smoker your your cost for life insurance is much higher Many health insurance companies um, also will give discounts to non-smokers. I know every year when I renew the state plan, which is a product of Blue Cross Blue Shield, my health insurance, I have to attest um, that I am a non-smoker, a never smoker, and um, I, get a, I get a benefit from that. If I were a smoker, I would have to pay um, more for my own personal health insurance. So I've listed down there the Center for Disease Control's website, and by no means do I expect you all to, to know all the information on that website, but if you are a smoker or you are a vapor, or if you know somebody who wants more information or somebody who wants to quit tobacco use, that's a really nice resource that you can use for that. Okay. So some of the techniques um, to help people quit smoking, let's first of all acknowledge that cigarette smoking 
has both both a physical dependency and a psychological dependency. So if both of those things are happening, one of the ways that we can assist people in quitting smoking a little more easily is to separate those two things. And the way that we separate those two things um, for some individuals is to supply them with nicotine replacement. And by doing so, they're doing the nicotine replacement um, and they are satisfying that physiological dependency while they are undoing all of the behavioral habits. Like what do they do with their hands? What do they do with their mouth? Um, how do they you know, break all of the, those kind of conditioned bonds while they're still getting uh, the nicotine replacement? What's also um, helpful with the nicotine replacement is that it is easier to con naturally control the dose and to taper down if you're doing nicotine replacement. So if you're doing the gum, you would be tapering less and less gum every day. If you're doing the patches, um, they usually you start off with a larger patch and you wear it for about a week and you get your nicotine and then you reduce the patch size and you reduce the patch size, etc. When cigarette smokers are naturally cutting back on the number of cigarettes that they smoke, they can't control or they don't control the dose nearly as well. They don't taper as well because what happens before a smoker's trying to quit, when they smoke a cigarette, they waste a lot of nicotine. So let's say they smoke a little bit and then they put it down and then they work on the computer or whatever and then they take another puff and they put it down. But as a cigarette smoker um, cuts back on the number of cigarettes that he or she has a day, what ends up happening with the cigarettes over time, they're like making love to the cigarette. They're getting almost like 100% of the nicotine out of it because their body knows that they're in that physiological dependency. And so even though they might be cutting back on cigarettes, the number, they may actually be getting more of the nicotine out of each individual cigarette. So rule of thumb for um, people in quitting is to set a quit date, to um, think about setting what, how many cigarettes do they need to be down to or where's their nicotine replacement they need to be down to at one half of the quit date. If they are just tapering on cigarettes, we kind of have this rule of thumb. If they can get down to seven or less a day, um, kind of bare minimum, then oftentimes going anywhere from three to seven a day down to zero and that kind of cold turkey from there. Behaviorally, one of the more common aversive therapies, this is where you're going to be adding positive punishment and trying to associate positive punishment to the cigarettes. Um, one of the aversion therapies that is used that needs to be medically supervised is when we have individuals um, chain smoke and smoke and you know light it up, smoke that cigarette, light up the next one, smoke that cigarette to the point of where they get physically sick. And the sick is kind of like that headachey, that nauseous, that feeling like they're going to vomit. All of you probably had situations where you've gotten a, a a uh, stomach bug or you had some food poisoning, you ate something and you got sick on it and then you didn't want that food forever more or for a very, very long time. Um, that would be an example of one trial learning a positive punishment. Um, and so what you do with the chain smoking is you have people do so much, they overdose on it that they physically get sick. And with the idea there that after that, the idea of smelling a cigarette, the idea of inhaling a cigarette, what it feels like would make them feel sick again. And it helps them to quit smoking. That has to be obviously medically supervised because it could be very dangerous because you're overdosing on the nicotine, which is that cardiovascular system stimulant. So let's talk about hypnosis. Um, hypnosis is a very deep sense of relaxation. And the thing that we add to that, that's not just ordinary relaxation or ordinary meditation. In hypnosis, you're adding suggestions. And what you're doing in those suggestions is you're trying to lay down in that person's um, memory an alternative course of action that gives them a choice when they're in that actual situation. So I'll just give you one example of a hypnotic suggestion. So let's say I'm working with a client who wakes up at 7 a.m. every morning, first thing they do is light up a cigarette and they smoke that cigarette before they um, move about, get their breakfast, um, take care of the kids, whatever. Um, so under hypnosis for that individual, I might after they're very deeply relaxed, they're very focused on what my communication is, I might say, okay, so tomorrow morning, 
your alarm goes off. I want you to imagine it's 7 a.m. And I want you to imagine the sound that your alarm makes that wakes you up. And you are going to be amazingly surprised that you get up and you use the bathroom and you go and you make breakfast and you go and you take care of your kids. You do everything you do in the morning and you're just surprisingly feeling like you just don't need that cigarette. And hours even can go by and you're like, wow, I haven't even smoked today. So that's an example of laying down an alternative. Neurologically, there's the old habit that the person would follow. And then there is a suggestion, at least for that one situation, that they're amazingly, they're going to be surprised that they're not experiencing withdrawal and craving and that type of thing. I'm not going to talk about rest. Let's talk about breaking classically conditioned bonds. Um, which would include using delay techniques and stimulus control. Okay, so if there are all these associations, these classically conditioned um, associations with the cigarettes that trigger that opponent process, trigger that craving, then we wanna start breaking those and, and re removing the power of those associations. So that would be breaking the classically conditioned bonds. One of the best ways of doing that is having a client determine a place in which he or she would smoke that is just kind of unappealing. So if the individual is, let's say, smoking inside um, in their home, we would insist that they go outside, preferably go outside somewhere kind of far away and only smoke their cigarettes in that particular um, environment. Okay, which, you know, imagine one of our snowy days where the snow's blowing sideways and it's freezing cold. Um, nobody's going to want to go outside and smoke a cigarette in that type of weather. I had a client at one point in time, really educated client, who um, was motivated to quit smoking in her home. And she was already smoking outside, like on her porch. It was no big deal. Um, but she, as we were getting creative, I said, okay, I want you to think about the grossest place, the yuckiest place um, in your home, which would be the only place you would allow yourself to smoke a cigarette. And her decision was to smoke underneath the crawl space around her porch. So she'd have to get underneath the porch in the crawl space. We have a, a log cabin and a wraparound porch. And I don't like going down under there, even though our hot water heaters there and the water filters there because um, there's spider webs and it's just kind of gross. Um, and anyway, so this particular client, so it's the first time she wants a cigarette. She makes herself go outside, goes down underneath the crawl space. And she's just like, you know, bent over because it's low hanging and she lights up her cigarette and she, uh, smoking her cigarette and she says she has this realization of like oh my gosh I am just like this animal here I'm just this animal underneath the deck with the spiders and the spider webs because I just need to get my drug kind of thing and that was enough for her to realize like realize okay this is ridiculous and then she was just able to quit smoking after that um but the stimulus control is very important. Um, and, and when we have clean indoor air laws, that has actually helped a lot of individuals who were smokers cut back on their smoking just because it is challenging to find places where they are, are allowed to smoke, legally um, and socially allowed to smoke. Um, the delay techniques, are, clients really love delay techniques because with delay techniques, you're able to give clients that this idea, like if I want a cigarette, I can get my cigarette, but what I have to do is delay the amount of time, X amount of time, and you work with the clients to come up with how much time that would be to delay before they're allowed to light up that cigarette and smoke that cigarette. And so the delay techniques are by altering the time um, is actually breaking those classically conditioned bonds. So let me give you a driving example. So let's say that I'm a smoker and when I get in my car and I've got a 30 minute commute to work, I always get in my car and I light up my cigarette and I enjoy that cigarette on my drive to work. And I've decided I'm going to commit to five minutes that I think I can get by five minutes. Um, and so I'm driving in my car and I wait for five minutes. If in five minutes I still really want that cigarette, I pull over, I light up, I enjoy that cigarette, okay? Let's say I've delayed it five minutes. Then I decide, okay, I'm going to start delaying it 10 minutes, and then I'm going to start delaying it 20 minutes. If I get delay it all the way 30 minutes, I've driven all the way to work and all the way home without lighting up a cigarette. And so again, clients like it because it's this idea, you know, if it gets really bad and I really want the cigarette, I can have the cigarette. Um, but using the delay techniques, first of all, the more and more and more and more you delay, the less and less and less and less they're, they're smoking every day. 
as well as the fact it is helping them break those classically conditioned bonds where now they can get in the car and drive and just not even want a cigarette. So good stuff. Clients like it. This is a um, graph uh, that just sort of takes a look at the fact that for cigarette smokers who have not been damaged by the, the cigarette smoking, the longer they have quit, the more they start to look like and approach the health of a never smoker. And so this is just kind of a reminder for people that it is never too late for them to quit smoking, that it's always a good idea. If they can't quit, can they cut back? If they, um, if they do quit over time, they end up feeling oftentimes, unless again, unless there's been damage like a cancer or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, over time they get to feeling better and better and their health gets better and better and they start returning to the health of a never smoker. All righty. All right. It says up here scientific effectiveness. So what are the ways that we can help clients um, scientifically to quit smoking? So lots of people are using medication nowadays. We've talked about the nicotine replacement and the nicotine replacement comes in a lot of different forms, patch gum, inhaler, nasal spray, lollipop. I've never seen anybody with a lollipop, but anyways, um, we do know that scientifically using nicotine replacement, separating that physical from the psychological and behavioral um, addiction increases odds of su success by 1.7. So it is helpful. Um, nicotine replacement can be expensive. It's more expensive than cigarettes. Um, but again, it's a, it's a nice physiological aid for a lot of individuals. Okay, talk about the antidepressants. Zyban, you see the little picture there of Zyban. Zyban is exactly the same thing as Wellbutrin and Bupropion. Um, but they just, they're given different trade names, brand names, I guess is really the word, different brand names marketed for different things. So Zyban is specifically marketed for smoking cessation. Well, Butrin and Bupropion are specifically marketed for treating chronic anxiety or treating depression, but they're the same thing. They are dopamine reuptake inhibitors and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. And putting it really simply, what that does for the brain is it supplies the brain with more dopamine and more norepinephrine, which kind of gives the brain a little more reward and a little bit more calm from the antidepressant so that for some individuals, there's not so much the need to go get that same kind of feeling from the cigarettes. Um, and so those are used frequently in smoking cessation. Um, interestingly, we know that there is a connection between smoking and depression. And when the literature has teased it apart, it seems that smokers are actually more at risk for developing depression than people who are depressed developing the smoking as a way of self-medicating. So when you start looking at those relationships, you actually see smoking as a risk factor um, for depression in, in people. Um, okay, let's talk about Chantix. Um, I wonder if there is anybody in here knows anyone who has taken Chantix. Um, Chantix is different than the antidepressants because the Chantix actually gets into the brain receptors and it locks in those receptors. You know, imagine this being a receptor and something locks into it. If you've got, you know, nicotine coming along, there's already something in there. It, it's not going to be, that receptor is not going to be able to receive anything else. It's already taken. And it does so by blocking the reinforcing effects of nicotine for a lot of individuals, meaning if that has already been satisfied, if you smoke on top of it, you're not really getting anything out of it because it's blocked into the reinforcing receptors already. The problem with Chantex and the thing that I would highly recommend if you know anybody who's going to be taking it, any healthcare provider who prescribes that should not write a prescription and send that person on their merry way and, and hope that it helps them quit smoking. The reason for that is that if you've got a chemical that's locking into many of those reinforcing receptors that make you feel reinforcement, and for some individuals, it not only, you know, you can't smoke and get more reinforcement from the cigarette, but for a lot of individuals, they stop feeling the power to have any reinforcement in their lives. So some individuals um, will fall into a very deep depression and can become suicidal 
um, on Chantix because it's taken away all their reinforcement, which again is why any healthcare provider who is prescribing that for smoking cessation should be following those patients very closely and carefully and screening them for depression and suicide. And if that's a side effect, they need to be taking them off of that medication. Okay, so the behavioral techniques for smoking cessation. So we've been talking about, you know, working on the physiology dependence the here, here, and now let's talk about the behavioral dependence. We know that um, motivational interviewing, um, where a person kind of comes down on their level, uh, gives them lots of empathy, lots of understanding for their smoking, and counsels them right th where they are in stages of changes. Um, is much more effective than, say, a confrontational approach um, to nagging, saying so, you, know, you need to quit smoking, that type of thing. Behavior modification, there's all kinds of things that we do. We have people do recording of their cigarette. Nowadays, you can get uh, apps for smoking cessation. Um, we take a look at what are the situations in which people are smoking because we want to try to break those classically conditioned bonds. Um, we oftentimes will have individuals even monitor their thought processes before they smoke. If they have a thought of like, I'm going to die if I don't get a cigarette, well, then that's a dysfunctional thought. Um, and so even doing things like taking that dysfunctional thought, I'm going to die if I don't have a cigarette of like, oh, I just noticed I'm craving a cigarette right now. Let me see how long I can go um, and try to resist this craving before I light up. Lots and lots of stuff we can do, behavior mod. We also, we've already talked about the um, setting the quit date, doing the half quit date, maybe even doing the fourth, um, making sure that they're making daily progress on tapering and cutting back, that kind of thing. All right, social support. We know that smoking cessation is a whole process. It is not an event. And we know that being able to do face-to-face -face set sessions um, with a healthcare provider or a counselor is going to be better than not having face-to-face -face sessions. And a lot of that has to do with, it's just much easier. It's kind of like, I'd like, I'd much rather be in the classroom teaching with you all, seeing you, seeing your reactions to what I'm talking about, instead of, I'm talking into my laptop right now um, as it's recording. It's not very personal. Um, I'm not reading my audience at all, which I, I really dislike, um, but we're doing the best we can here. Um, so face-to-face -face is better, but we also know though that the telephone lines when you can call in, and get regular counseling on a telephone. And there are even apps where you can get social support and counseling advice on an app on your phone. That stuff works too, but the face-to-face -face is better. We know that regular sessions are better than one, again, because with the regular sessions, it's, you know, you're treating the process, not just this one event that day that they actually quit. Um, and as you are doing the regular sessions, you can reassess where is this person in those stages of change. Um, and as they move through those stages of change, they encounter different problems and different successes so that you can deal with the new barriers in regular sessions that you wouldn't be able to deal with um, all in one. And we know that using stages of change, that trans theoretical model, um, is much better than a non-tailored approach. And I've got video clips at the end of this lecture that will definitely um, bring that to life. Okay, some public health approaches to cigarette smoking. Clean indoor air laws have worked wonders in not only protecting those of us from secondhand smoke, from other people's smoke, but they have actually worked wonders in helping actual cigarette smokers cut back if they can't smoke where they work, if they can't smoke where um, they recreate or whatnot, then they end up smoking a lot less. So clean indoor air laws is a beautiful thing. When I got here in ASU in North Carolina uh, many moons ago, um, Smith Wright Hall, the psych department, had ashtrays sitting in the hallways. Students would be sitting on the floor in the hallway smoking cigarettes because the ashtrays were there. Students would even come from other buildings to Smith Wright Hall because we had the ashtrays. And so there was a tremendous amount of smoke in Smith Wright um, before um, the state of North Carolina UNC system was able to actually catch up with clean indoor air laws in all of its public buildings. And obviously we're a public university. So yes. So, any, oh, anyways, back in the old days, we got rid of the, the trap. When I, when I first got hired here and I realized like, the ashtrays were a stimulus to smoke. 
um, in Smith Wright Hall. And we just agreed as faculty that we were going to get rid of the ashtrays and that reduced all of the smoking in the building. So easy fix. Um, second thing is restriction to minors. Um, when I was a little girl, if you went just about every restaurant, you would see them in the uh, near the doors in um, grocery stores or convenience stores, there were cigarette machines. Like you could go in and put money, anybody could. So even a little kid could go do this. Go put money in a machine, pull the vending machine and get their cigarette, very much like you would get, say, a Pepsi out of a vending machine nowadays. Um, those were outlawed because there were a lot of um, minors accessing um, cigarettes in that situation. Okay, other restrictions to minors. One of my former graduate students, um, she got her degree in clinical health psych and she works in public health. And she says the, um, the James Bond part of her job is she hires these teenagers that are minors that are under the age of 18 because most states have a law that you're not allowed to purchase cigarettes unless you're 18 years old. And she drives these minors around and she sends them into convenience stores and she sends them into grocery stores and that kind of thing. And it, if they sell cigarettes to this minor that she has hired um, without IDing them, or if they sell them and they don't ID them, then she busts the she busts the store and they get in trouble and then they can no longer sell uh, cigarettes. Um, restricting advertising. There had when I was little on TV, we would actually see commercials of people enjoying cigarettes, and that got outlawed. Most um, billboards nowadays, well, first of all, there are different regional, state and regional restrictions on even can you have billboards for cigarette ads, but on the billboards even nowadays, you can't actually show a person smoking. It's just usually there might be a person there, or there might be Joe Camel or whatnot, and then a picture of the, the brand for the cigarette, but you can't even actually show them smoking. And then lots of different um, events have just um, either chosen to disallow cigarette advertising at their events or there are laws preventing that. Increasing sin taxes, um, which are, it's actually would be disincentive taxes as well as sin, like the sin you're going to hell kind of thing. Um, and so we call them sin taxes. Um, we in the tobacco belt, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, we do not have very large disincentive taxes attached to our cigarettes. Um, but most of the other states in the country, they do add these taxes to every pack of cigarettes that is purchased. And I love that because then you take the tax revenue and you can ideally, if you fund that tax revenue back into healthcare, um, it would make a lot of sense to try to counterbalance all the people that are injured from cigarettes. What is also interesting with disincentive taxes is remember we talked about it's lower socioeconomic status, lower SES individuals that do most of the smoking people that have, less money do most of the smoking. So if you raise the cost, the price of cigarettes, most individuals will have a breaking point. Most individuals, when you raise that uh, disincentive tax, um, will automatically cut back on their cigarette smoking because it's just so expensive. But most people even will have a breaking point where it's like, I gotta, I gotta quit this because I just can't afford, it's way too much money. Um, so those work. Um, Public education, um, the best advertisements um, to educate the public that have actually worked are the truth ads. Um, and hopefully some of you in here have seen the truth ads. Those are effective. There have been a lot of attempts at education that um, has not been very effective. Um, it'll be interesting to see how public health departments um, and Center for Disease Control start to spin out um, education related to vaping. Um, I know I've seen one billboard about talk, talk with your kids, talk with your kids about smoking or talk with your kids when you're hanging out with them about smoking and vaping and that type of thing. So the lawsuits, um, remember we talked about the master settlement agreement um, has ended big lawsuits or individual lawsuits or big lawsuits like class action suits in a lot of the states, but lawsuits have been very powerful in um, making clear who is responsible for the cigarette smoking. And, I, and I, I wrestle with this too. Is it the person who smokes is responsible and is that person responsible for any illness or health consequences 
or is the tobacco industry that has been deliberately marketing and increasing the potency of nicotine, are they to blame that people are getting addicted and stuck to cigarettes? And so lawsuits have helped kind of clarify some of that responsibility um, piece to it. And, and we, and certainly in 2020, we know that tobacco industry has been fraudulent and deceptive um, and they have been hiding a lot of things over the years and they deserve to be taking more responsibility. And then the last thing would be um, funding research. So funding research on what are the best things to do in terms of prevention. Um, nowadays, there are quite a few scientists writing um, research grants, trying to get funding to study vaping as an example. I've got a friend out in Colorado, um, now that marijuana is legal, there she is studying in teenagers the health effects of um, having easier access to, to marijuana and what that could be doing um, with teens and their lungs and their health if more teens are smoking more marijuana as an example. Okay, so I've got three video clips that I want you to watch. And as you watch each of these, um, what I want you paying attention to, these are, this is like a health department um, educational programming for healthcare providers who are going to be counseling anybody in smoking cessation. These particular um, counselors and the training that they're offering would be to counseling women who are pregnant who are cigarette smokers. And um, as you watch this, the two things I really want you paying attention to are how they're using stages of change, how they're using Prochaska and DeClemente's trans theoretical model that we covered during our behavior change lecture. So they're using, using stages of change to diagnose their clients and figure out where they are in this readiness for change and then deliberately getting down to whatever level they're at, whether they're the pre-contemplation, contemplation, action, preparation, whatever, getting down to their level and counseling them, tailoring that intervention at their level. So pay attention to that. I also want you to pay attention to how the motivational interviewing techniques um, are really effective at, at, at staying at that person's level, keeping them in that relationship, empathizing with them, understanding them where they're at, absolutely not being judgmental and absolutely not being confrontational because as soon as you are judgmental or confrontational think about how that would feel for yourself that person's checked out they're defensive and they're checked out so one of the things they're going to model for you early on is one of the counselors this always tickles me when i watch it one of the counselors she's not been trained yet and she's demonstrating working with the patient trying to counsel that patient in smoking cessation and you can tell she's getting upset that her patient hasn't quit smoking and then she even raises her voice which is horrible that'd be a horrible thing to do with a with a client she raises her voice and then you see the client just like oh you know you can see the nonverbals. the client's like oh you just yelled at me um and then she gets, you know, she has a come to Jesus moment. She gets, she gets her training. And then you see her uh, rectify herself after she has learned how to do the motivational interviewing, the stages of change. And then she improves upon her counseling skills. And so I just want you to watch it done poorly. And then I want you to watch it done well. Another point I want to bring up as you watch these videos, there's one particular um, scene where there is a woman who is pregnant with a, another child and she's got a little child playing on the floor. So, you know, she's got at least another, she already has one child and the, the counselors in there to help her quit smoking. This is a real common thing that we health psychologists see when we are working in a medical setting. We oftentimes get sent in to meet a client to do a certain thing, like focus on helping them quit smoking or focus on helping them manage their diabetes or, or whatever it might be, or helping them manage their pain. But a lot of times as a healthcare provider, we get in there, even though a physician has given us one goal for this client, and we get in there and there's oftentimes other problems or a bigger, bigger picture issues or things that somebody um, needs to have to deal with. And we have to switch gears. So, you know, even if we go in with our agenda, what we're supposed to be doing, 
we have to listen. We have to listen very carefully and find out what this person is telling us is a priority concern for them. So there, in the case with the woman with the little kid on, playing on the floor and the counselor, she brings up at one point, um, her stress level. And it's like, oh, I've got this stress and I, I, don't ha I don't have much support at home. And you get this impression like, okay, she got the one kid, she got another kid on the way. Ideally, what the counselor would do at that point in time is say, hey, won't you tell me about what's going on at home? Because maybe that particular woman doesn't want to talk about smoking cessation right now. Maybe she's got bigger problems that she needs to talk about. I can give you an example. I was sent in with a client at one point who was um, morbidly obese and had um, type two diabetes and her type two, she wasn't doing all the stuff she was supposed to do to manage her type two diabetes. And um, I get in there with her and start uh, talking about that. And then as I'm listening to her, I end up after listening and asking questions, she was a domestic violence um, victim in her own home. And she was terrified. She was terrified of what the harm was happening to her kids, what was happening to her. And we really had to switch gears and get her hooked up with, um, like it would be Oasis here in Boone as our local domestic shelter and, and help her develop a safety plan um, and a plan for getting out of that, that unsafe home. And then, you know, after that, then, it would make some sense to be able to um, counsel that person and deal with her diabetes. So I want you to pay attention to that kind of stuff also. Know that this is not um, <laughs> Academy Award winning acting that you're going to see. These are health professionals who are kind of uh, portraying these clients and these, um, these counselors. So if you feel a need to giggle at their acting, go ahead and do that. What I also want you paying attention to well, first of all, let me say what I don't want you paying attention to. They love their five A's in this thing. And I don't love the five A's. In fact, I just sort of find the five A's to be confusing. So just feel free to wipe that from the record. And I'm not going to trick you and quiz you on the five A's in your exam, that type of thing. But what I do want you paying attention to, they've got some different names for things that they are deliberately asking individuals to utilize to assist them in their smoking cessation. And I want you deliberately thinking through like what in like the behavior change lecture, what are they talking about here? Oh, they're talking about social support here when they're saying, have you, have you thought about asking your family not to smoke around you when you're a pregnant woman? And the person's like, no, I haven't thought about that, but you know, if I, if I thought, if I did that, I think they would be willing to not smoke around me. Social support, got it? Um, as well as environmental support. Um, uh, figuring out plans of not to have many cigarettes around in the, the home if they're trying to cut back, that would be Simmons control. So I want you to be thinking through as you watch each of these, um, what would you call the intervention or the treatments they are actually delivering um, for these women who are pregnant cigarette smokers. And then what I also want you to know is that this stuff, the stages of change, the motivational interviewing, all of the behavior modification stuff that they are using applies to, you could use this with a 80 year old man. If you're helping him quit smoking, it doesn't necessarily just pertain to um, women who are pregnant. It does make some sense that targeting women who are pregnant is very important, especially considering all the stuff we did part one of the lecture talking about how dangerous it is for a developing fetus. Uh, it is dangerous to be smoking around other people in the home, other kids in the home, that type of thing. All righty. If you have any questions, please load those questions to the forum on As You Learn so that everybody can see what your questions are in part two of this lecture. And I will check that regularly and answer any of those questions. And I will be in touch real soon if I if this is not already posted on As You Learn, what your online at home or wherever you're at at home, open book, open note, um, exam number two, because this is the smoking is the last of the material that we have covered. Since then, we have covered also cardiovascular disease, eating disorders, um, exercise, physical activity, uh, and social support. So, and all of that's on your syllabus. So, so the second exam will really emphasize the material since exam one up until right now, 
the end of the smoking cessation. There might be a few items on the exam that are kind of cumulative, um, that may be stuff that we talked about in the first exam part of class, but then we've been uh, either talking about it again or we've been integrating it. Um, so there'll be some questions like that. What I have already done, and I'll remind you of this on As You Learn, I normally include uh, like a handful of book questions on each exam. I have pulled those because I do not have an online option for you for your textbook. And I'm just going to assume that many of you are um, somewhere without your textbook. Hey, I guess you don't travel with Straub all the time. That's okay. Um, so just to be fair and to try to help maximize your ability to learn and show me what you've learned on the exam, I've pulled those. All righty, everybody. Um, I hope you're enjoying your extended spring break. I realize a lot of you out there are experiencing a good bit of anxiety about what's going on. I hope that you and your families and your friends have not been infected. Um, I realize that many of you are um, working or you are home and caretaking. I realize that some of you may be bored <laughs> out of your mind, um, but for a lot of you, I know this is a really stressful time and I feel for you um, because this is weird times that we are in. All right, everybody, I will see you health psych students later. And next lecture you will see is after your second exam. Take care. Bye.